the comedy audience is judging you every 12 seconds, which is basically whenever you have a punchline. It's a lot of ups and downs. It's really confusing, mental health wise, to be in the same space every day and it to be going differently. You have an absolutely blinding, amazing show where everything just works and the audience are loving it. And then any show that isn't up to that standard is a failure. I was really surprised that David said, do you want to do Mock the Week the first time? But then you're just immediately full of dread and nerves. When you're offered something where you're like, it has a legacy, you go, I, I want to do this right. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Unfiltered. My name is Ollie Dudmore. My guest today is a comedian whose regular appearances on Live at the Apollo and Mock the Week turned him into a household name before his 30th birthday. He began his stand-up career while still a student at the University of Manchester. Within the year, he'd performed at the Edinburgh Fringe and placed as a finalist in both the Laughing Boy New Act competition and Comedy Central's Funniest Student. His stand-up has been described as verbally virtuosic and his sets as lightning-paced, gag-dense, precision-delivered. After his most recent stint at the Fringe last month, he's now undertaking his second nationwide tour, Spilt Milk. My guest today is Rhys James. Hello, thank Hello. you. Who's described me as, what was it? Verbally virtuosic. I don't know if I've ever heard that. It's a, uh, it's a tough one, to be fair, as well, to read out. So I'm glad you stumbled on it as, as, yeah, well, as well I as mean, I Yeah, well, I mean, what an ironic phrase to stumble on. I don't have um, footnotes for the sourcing. I'm sure we can get that over to There'll you. There'll be after. a little one next to it. Citation so, needed, yeah, let's say, for that one. You can print it out, and I don't know what you do with your positive reviews. Stick them up above your bed or something. 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah they're all tattooed there. on the inside of my eyelids. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you, mate? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Thanks yeah. for having me. Good. No, it's a pleasure. Really nice to have you on. Um, I enjoy having comedians as well because generally speaking you know not wanting to make any assumptions about how this interview is going to go mm. but i enjoy having a bit of back and forth and some fun as opposed to i don't know some of the slightly heavy hitters that we've got coming yeah, up you have some serious you have some really serious intense chats uh i think gordon brown's going to be sat in that chair okay at, at some point okay so, he's a laugh yeah yeah <laughs> he's a laugh if, as long as you tell him the mics are off then yeah. he becomes a laugh then, then famously. You get some gold out get of him, him in a taxi tell him that the interview's over he'll say some great stuff it's not me interviewing actually it's gillian duffy who's going to be sat here conducting the interview oh, um gillian the advice that i just told you <laughs> and we'll all have some lovely fun what's the story you're back out on tour all over the back UK. on the road it's the classic yeah the jobbing comic yeah exactly you gotta you gotta get on tour you gotta write a show and then show it to people mm -hmm. that's how it works for you know various reasons a lot of them financial <laughs> um, but also the love of the game and whatnot yeah um, yeah yeah. The love yeah, of the craft, tour. The i've been doing it since january mm -hmm. um little had like a couple of months not doing it did it in edinburgh mm -hmm. and back on the road till the end of the year you it takes so long to write a show a new mm -hmm. show that you just try and bring as much out of it as possible. Yeah. Try and do it for as long as possible. To put off having to do it again. Exactly. This is why I don't understand the topical comics. I, you know, I get the topical comics on a panel show or something, but you know, when you do topical stand-ups who tour with topical stuff and they're constantly having to go out and do brand new every night. Yeah. Now, obviously that is good, but you want to build a show mm -hmm. and then just go out and have the show. There is one thing I've had to change, which is, I, this is when you notice that you've been doing the show for too long. If you say your age in the show, and then realize, oh, I've, I keep saying an, a previous age. Yeah. So there was a lot, there were like, there's jokes in the show about, you know, turning 31, thus being the end of the rail card years for me and what that means in the grand scheme of things. Rough. And then being 32 and realizing, well, you can't really say it's officially the end of the rail card years because that is obviously a year ago. Uh huh. Uh huh. So then you go, oh, God, okay. Update the material, Reese. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Needs stuff. must. I guess also it must be, um, Fairly intense. If you're constantly writing, like someone you're describing being topical, mm. always writing, always refining, and trying to get the sort of stagecraft of it right, presumably that's a relatively intense place to be. More intense than already just going on stage and performing, which can be obviously quite... Yeah, I mean, certainly the way I like to work is like, I get it pretty down. Like, I, it's really fun. The early stages are really fun when you're loose and you're just playing around with ideas and there's no deadline. That's, I think, the most fun bit. But once you're on tour, it's like a finished product and there's room to be loose within that and, you know chat to the crowd or like if, you know, if something happens or if you've got an idea to play around with it mm. or just extend the joke effectively and just keep talking about it. But, you know, if you're a topical comic and you've got a show, but then something incredibly significant were to happen that day, it's like, it's almost like you you've can't... You've got to talk about it. the audience are going, why would you not mention that? Mm -hmm. The rest of this is, all, is topical up to a week ago. You've got to talk about that. So then, mm -hmm. and it's very tiring being on tour. You know, you're working up to an hour and a half a day. Fucking hell, slow down. Exhausting stuff. So... <laughs> So actually, you know what the thing is? It's not even the coming up with the jokes because that, um, funnily enough, isn't as difficult. It, to me, it's the, the reading. Yeah. The constant reading. I have to be aware of all the news. I was saying across Leave events. Yeah, full on. Yeah. No one wants to have to do that. Yeah, I was, th I was thinking then that perhaps maybe it would have been an easier gig being a topical, um, a topical comic 
pre-2016, before sort of British yeah, politics when went was like, completely mental. And you could predict it. Oh, Glastonbury's muddy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, there we go. 10 minutes on That's that. 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. But now, you know, Liz Truss tanks the pound and has resigned and is in like a battle of souls with a lettuce. Yeah. And that's Monday morning. Exactly. And it's already quite funny. Mm. There's not much to add to that. I bet, you know, you could just go out and go, so Liz Truss and everyone go, ha, 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 brilliant. <laughs> I always find, uh, I don't know about you, I, when people go, this is just like the thick of it. Or, yeah. you know, it's beyond satire at this point. Yeah. And I, I don't know, it's sort of, it, it does grate on me a little bit because I'm kind of thinking, well, is, is, it, is, is, it, is, it, is it a good thing that we're there? Is it? And well, also the thick of it was successful because it was true to life. Yeah. So for it to suddenly blow minds that politics is similar to the thing politics was, <laughs> uh, the, the thing that it was parodying. You go, yeah, yeah, that was the point of the thick of it. Is that, oh, aren't pol politicians are silly. It was just done in an expert way. Yeah. And we get to see like a sort of imagined behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. But it was, they were literally imagining what the current politicians at the time were like. And so it just happens that the ones now are also like it. Yeah. We just have a bit more access to stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there's more cameras, you know, mics are left on, like I say, a bit more. For me, one of the um, the craziest things, about that, that Malcolm Tucker character, right, it's, it's, a, it's a direct sort of, the inspiration for that is drawn from Alistair Campbell, right? Mm. It's the sort of the, the sweary, bruising political enforcer. Yeah. His transition to essentially being sort of like a woolly mental health campaigner, <laughs> having like been one of the key architects behind like an illegal invasion of another country, blows my mind. Mm. Whoever's doing his like PR brand stuff. Yeah. Genius. That's what podcasts do for you, man. I know. Why do you I think I'm here? What, covering... was your, what was your dark past? What have you done? Covering up war crimes. You've yeah. covered up war crimes as well. And now you're reinventing yourself. <laughs> exactly. On Joe. What are we washing you for? What have and you that's done? I can't, it will come out, but yeah. let's, let's leave it for now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we like the, the whole sort of concept of the show, right, is understanding you sort of through life events, things that have happened to you, how you got mm. to here. We like to begin at the beginning. Sensible, I think. Where's home? How do you feel about it? Well, I was born age zero in Very good. Uh, Swindon. Right. Got out pretty quick. Not my decision, but I'm grateful for it. Yep. Um, and then moved to Hertfordshire. Okay. My home county's lad. Uh huh. Uh, is that a phrase? Probably not. Maybe. And um, yeah, there's merch. The home <laughs> county's lads. Yeah, yeah. So not up. the most intimidating gang. Exactly. Um, I grew up in a, heart, a little town called Harpenden, yeah. Hertfordshire. Uh, then became older, went to University of Manchester, mm -hmm. which I think was already referred to. So I guess that is what, you know, technically is home. Mm -hmm. My parents still live there. Uh, I go there sometimes to see the cats. Thoughts and feels on Hamden as a place into it. It was voted the in like some Telegraph thing. Mm. It was and it was Telegraph and some like Savills or something like that. It was like the number one place to live in England or something like that. Is that basically. how you feel about it? No, <laughs> um, no. I see why they would say that. Okay, it's like quite idyllic. It's like it's commutable. Mm. It's twenty five minutes into central London and all that sort of stuff, but it's not London mm. and it's. You know, there's lots of greenery and there's some nice coffee shops and stuff. But it's, like, it's kind of damning that that's what passes for like the best place in the yeah, country. Yeah, I now. think that is kind of it though, isn't it? It's like, and there's, you know, there's probably, there's probably jobs and it's all about, you know, industry and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. also like happiness and there's like, and wealth and houses and what's available and all this shit. And there's probably a good dentist there. No doubt. And all this bollocks. So yeah. If you go to the high street, it's just a billion estate agents. Mm -hmm. Um, a slug and lettuce that has since become sort of knockoff Weatherspoons. More of an all bar one myself, man myself. Yeah, it's become that. But to me, that's incongruent with what Harpenden tries to represent. Yeah. For years, my whole childhood was whenever a shop would close, it would be the rumors of that's going to be a McDonald's. And then every single time it would be campaigned against because we can't have a, we can't possibly have a McDonald's in Harpenden. Yeah, it would bring it. it would bring the culture down. Absolutely, yeah, there'd be we, litter everywhere. Wouldn't be number one on the Telegraph. No, exactly. You've got no chance for McDonald's. Mm. Um, so that's the vibe. My friend Greg, who is a travel writer for the Telegraph, did a feature where he went back to Harpenden to see. He also grew up in Harpenden mm. to say that this has happened. I'll go and see if it's changed and if I agree with this. Yeah. What I admire about the article he wrote, I'm sure I shouldn't be saying this is that he just found a way to use it to plug lots of our friends' businesses <laughs> that, are, that are now in Harpenden. Yep. And I was like, all right, you're, you, you know, this is it. whatever. Use your, use your platform. Paying it back. Exactly. I guess so. I guess it's better, better that he's elevating some... Specific things. He didn't want to... He clearly, I don't think... He didn't really want to slag off Harpenden, even though deep down he was like, yeah, that's not number one. Mm -hmm. But he just thought, right, here's an opportunity. Our friends have opened a coffee and bagel shop. Let's plug that. Is there a Mackey's there yet? There's no Mackey's. There was briefly a Subway, but that failed. Short-lived. 
Yeah. Very exciting when that turned up. Rather, pretty low it? down my ranking of um, the sort of top fast food places. That's b- pretty below Burger King. I was but you know, it's the way. biggest franchise in the world. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not know that. I know. It's a good quiz question to ask people. That's Because everyone guesses Starbucks, McDonald's. Yeah, you would think so, wouldn't you? Foolish. Subway. In, Where are they big? It's just the States. I think in everywhere. In, <laughs> well, clearly. In every yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's how you get to be the biggest franchise in the mm-hmm. world. Yeah. How old were you when you left Swindon? Too young to form an opinion about it? In theory, but I have opinions about it. Yeah? I was like four. Let's go. And My also, grandparents remained there, so I'd go back there sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, Swindon. Oh, let me think about how the Swindon show is selling, actually, before I say <laughs> it off. And if, and if they're offering refunds. Yeah. I mean, you know, it has its merits, but undeniably is a shithole. Um, <laughs> as is true of all the tour dates. Please yeah. come along. Um, <laughs> I love your town. No, it's uh, Swindon. It's all right. It's mm. all right. But I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to draw go. too much there. Uh, yeah, I yeah. um, I did. But it's a comedy punchline as well. It's used a lot as a comedy punchline. Asshole of the world in Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. Is it? I right, think right. Is how it's described there. Yeah, I feel like the ones are um, Coventry, Swindon, and Milton Keynes are like the comedy. The butt of every joke. The comedy. Yeah, they're punchline towns. And Hull. And Hull. Okay. Yeah, and actually, there's a fairly decent. You're sort of talking. There's not too much sort of north-south divide there, is there? You're being sort of pretty... Yeah, yeah, it's not just saying the north is a shithole. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of places in the north that are wonderful. Can you name one? Oh, do you want me to? Yeah. <laughs> um, I can. No further questions. That's it. Job uh, done. <laughs> well, I love Manchester. I went to Manchester. Yeah. Love Manchester. Love, I love Leeds. Mm-hmm. There's two. How many more do you need? That's enough. Yeah, that's good. I'm just just, just Lincoln, checking they con- Would they consider Lincoln the north? East Midlands for me. I consider it the north because it's above... Watford. Uh, right, very good. But uh, it's ass. That come on. Uh, for me, as York, lovely, charming. Newcastle, Harrogate. Harrogate, sure. Lovely Why not? Part, lovely part of the world. Probably, you're probably doing a date there, no? Uh, I don't know, but yeah, you tell me. <laughs> I don't have them here. <laughs> um, no, I sort of. I grew up in the West Midlands, so I'm I'm sort of quite aware of the weird bit in the middle. But the problem there is Skegness, which technically I think is Lincolnshire, but for uh. me just has the energy of the north. Right, yeah, Skegness, it sounds like it's the north. Skeggy, yeah, but technically East Midlands, I think. Anyway, we've got a little bit of a tangent think, there. Yeah, the, you know, in terms of this north-south divide, mm. and not to be directly insulting to you and what you just said, i say the Midlands is the weirder bit. Do you think so? I think there, there should be a south and north versus Midlands, I think, should be what the country We often get by. left behind in that rivalry. Yeah, yeah. Well, where, do, where do you come into that where do you stand on the whole north south divide i think you sort of go on density of greggs is a pretty strong right pretty strong divide and where did you grow up stratford what's the greggs situation one single greggs town of about eighty thousand people so you're yeah, you're not in the capita, north you're not the north for me interestingly i think it's sort of on a bit of a slant it's sort of, i wouldn't say that the, the line was sort of horizontal you know it doesn't sit squarely it's kind mm. of diagonal so west midlands for me in the sort of more southern whereas as you go East, you're sort of getting more northern, I think, is kind of how right, my okay. interpretation Interesting. of it. Interesting. Yeah. Stratford upon Avon? Yes. That's the south. It's got the it's, south. It's, the it's got the vibe of the south, though. I don't yeah. mean geographically. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, Stratford upon Avon to me is, is posher than. Close. Avon. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's sort of Cotswolds adjacent. Lovely. Your banks are Tudor buildings. They are, correct. Yeah. So how can you possibly look at this? It's mad. It's Stratford upon Avon. Famously, they don't have any Tudor buildings in the north. It's like, a, yeah. it's like a fairy tale land, though. Stratford yeah. upon Avon. It's like somewhere, if a tourist came there, they would assume. And they do. This is like a bit of Disneyland that's just about Hogwarts. Dare I suggest that that might be deliberate? Yeah. I, yeah, right, I think right, they right. So very much. Branded like that. The old buildings are not sort of, you know, prefab not knockoffs. You've been up at the fringe? Yes. How was it? It was all right. Okay. There you go. If we're talking cobbled streets. Yes. Then, yeah. It's very much my bag as hills. a Stratford man. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was good. I, li- I mean,. Yeah, I was only there for a week this time. So previously, you do the whole month. Yeah. Always do the month. But yeah, I was just doing an existing show. Just did it in a, for a week in a bigger room. Bit more fun. Bit yeah. less work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. Because I think when you start, if I'm not saying when you start up there, it is pretty taxing, right? Flyering for your own shows. Yeah. Small rooms, etc. Yeah, you just like, you're kind of in the grind at that stage. So, you know, people think when you start up there is when you're like, you do your first, your debut show. Yeah. You did years before that doing mixed bill things where you're doing 20 minutes and other people are doing 20 minutes, but you're doing it the same room, same time every day. Mm-hmm. And you're flying for that, trying to get spotted. You do like go up and do years of that showcase shows, really, and like competitions and like spots on gigs, trying to get on best of the fest and all that. And then the debut is almost like a culmination of a number of years of putting in that different type of sort of grind. Mm. I hate, sort of hate you that word. I don't really mean that. Grind set. Uh, exactly. Yeah. It's not that at all because it's, 
certainly not getting up at 5 a.m. and doing Mark Wahlberg's schedule. <laughs> um, and then once you're doing your debut, that's sort of like you sort of realizing a lot of that work and launching. But yeah, that is, I'd say more, once you're doing the debut, typically you'll like have a team or, you know, a promoter. So you won't be necessarily flyering it yourself, but you'll be in a small room. And the taxing thing more would be sort of, it's more emotionally taxing than anything else. Because it's a very, you know, it's a lot of ups and downs. Yeah. It's really sort of con brain confusing, well, that, which is all confusing, actually. Mm. Um, it's very leg confusing, this for it. <laughs> it's really confusing. It's like mental health wise, I guess, to be in the same space every day and it to be going differently. Yeah. So you're in, literally, it's the same room, it's the same time. And it, when it's like, but every show is completely different in Bend terms material? of how it's react. Yeah, yeah. So you've built a show, mm. but the reactions being different every day. And being like, you know, you might have a blinder one day. Also, you know, natural human instinct is that your best show becomes your default show in your brain. Yeah. When you can, you can never take the average. Mm. So, you know, you have an absolutely blinding, amazing show where everything just works and the audience are loving it. And then any show that isn't up to that standard is, you interpret it sort of as a failure. It's sort of very difficult to get to a point where you don't do that. Mm. Certainly early on as well. You naturally do that when really you want to be taking the average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually that one doesn't represent it at all. But of course you're going to go, but it can be that good. So it must now be that good every day. I did a bit of um, work for uh, a play called Accidental Death of an Anarchist. And I saw the matinee performance just to go and see the play. So mm. that I could then, I was doing, hosting a panel afterwards with some campaigners. It was about um, death in police custody. And so I saw the matinee version. And then yesterday I went and did the panel and also watched the show in the evening. And despite the fact that the show was scripted, performed in nearly exactly the same way. Yeah the difference in the crowd between the matinee and the evening was so dramatic that yeah. sort of the, the vibe and the energy of the performance was completely different. Exactly. And I, it was one of the first times I've ever seen the same thing sort of twice in close succession. So yeah. I actually had something to compare, but I'd never thought about the way that actually the audience can dictate yeah, yeah, yeah. How, it, how it lands, which obviously must be something you're pretty acutely aware of. As a stand yeah, hundred percent. And a matinee, I'm assuming the matinee was worse. Yeah, well, With the diff like less sedate, less of a vibe. It was quite comedic, more so chilled, more chuckled rather than sort of yeah. gut roaring laughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is always the way mm. because alcohol has a part to play. Very, um, very true. Yeah, uh, I hadn't thought about that. But and also just like a night out is a different energy in yourself, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's a different demographic. It was matinees are a lot older. Correct. And they don't laugh as much. Yeah. Not got as much breath in their lungs. Particularly about, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're going to have to fact check that, I believe. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, deaths of, it was, you know, a show sort of quite a liberal leaning play as well about sort of, you know, deaths in police custody and right. jokes about safe spaces and shit like that that um, probably wouldn't have necessarily have tickled the elder generation. Not chimed. Yes. Yeah, something they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> don't know. You're probably using phrases. They're like, well, this is internet language. I don't know uh, what's going on. Not but, to patronize. They're on the internet, these people. Okay. They've got <laughs> dogs as their pictures and they're slagging me off. <laughs> but that's not the point. Um, yeah, it's a completely different vibe. Like, it's, but it's different every tour show as well. Mm. Um, but that is sort of fine because, you know, you get, you know, you do it for a long time and you get used to that. I did a thing, like, luckily early on in sort of my fringe going uh, career is I went to see Tim Key and then I went the next night to see him again because I took a friend and it was a completely different vibe. Mm. The first night I went, he was absolutely annihilating it. And so he had this just like very playful, fun energy. And then when I went back the next night, he wasn't smashing it as hard. It was a much tougher crowd. It still was a good gig and he was doing well, but his vibe was identical. Like he was still just as playful and fun. Mm. And that's when I was like, right, you just have to, it doesn't matter. You, just, you basically just have to give them the show as best, like in the way you want to. Now, also, as a stand-up, you can't really do this in a play so much, but as a stand-up, you know, you can say anything you want. They don't know what you're going to say. They don't know if you're not doing the jokes mm. anymore. So you can do anything, right? So it can sometimes yield results if you do come out of it and go, what's going on here? Why is everyone being so quiet and reticent? And there's some comics who are amazing at that. Bill Burr, there's loads of clips of Bill Burr online being like, why is it so quiet in here? And then the crowd really turn and change in a good way. Mm. But there's also hundreds of examples of comedians, myself included, doing that and it becoming a lot, lot worse. Yeah. So you basically have to sort of judge it. I'd say it because what makes it worse more often than it makes it better. But sometimes if there's an elephant in the room you can address, it makes a huge difference. Really? Yeah. Like if there's something, even if it's just the boiling in the room or something like that, mm. and you mention it, everyone just relaxes and goes, oh, he knows or something like that. Uh -huh. Just anything. Sometimes they're all like, there's a certain tension around something and you, you speculate on why. Sometimes that can be really funny. 
which obviously in a play is just like not possible. Yeah. You just have to do the play. You can't break. Well, I guess you could. You could. Start ad libbing. You'd be in trouble. The yeah, wall, the yeah. rest of the cast would be unhappy about it. <laughs> is it possible then, if you are bombing, to sort of pull it back and sort of save it? Yeah. Or it is possible. Yeah, and it's possible to do the opposite as well. Yeah. You could possibly be having a great gig and then to really start bombing. Yeah. You're just on the edge at all times. They're, 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 the comedy audience is judging you every 12 seconds effectively, which is basically whenever you have a punchline. Mm. They're just judging you every single time. And it doesn't completely reset. There's goodwill, but goodwill lasts only so long. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you've got to keep the ball in the air. You've got to keep it interesting. You know, they might be into one routine and think, oh, great, we're going to go with this. If your next one, if they're like, this is crap, they're not just going to be like, oh, but the last one was funny, so I'll just keep laughing and smiling. They'll go, mm. If you're with maybe new material or a tour or whatever and you're in that situation is there an inclination to go back to perhaps something older that you know has delivered laughs before that you go definitely not on tour yeah not when it's a finished show because it's I shouldn't nothing should be failing yeah. in a finished show uh -huh. so it would be more that I would do the whole thing of what's going on here right if a bit I know that's consistently worked on tour in all other towns is suddenly failing in Horsham then I would go into a bit that they would find funny about why the people of Horsham don't relate to this particular bit of material that mm -hmm. everyone else has. In a new material gig, it, you, you, yeah, there is a temptation sometimes. And actually early on when you're building a show, it's good to sort of pepper a couple of bits of, a couple of old jokes that are maybe relevant to the bit. I like to use it as a little litmus test because I go, I know how, what sort of size laugh I'm expecting for that joke. Therefore, I can compare these, these new laughs. Got you to that and go yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, well, they only laugh so much at that one, so those are actually good. Or, ah, mm -hmm. uh, and then I did some old stuff and it really killed, so these weren't real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not really useful because the whole point of doing new stuff is you're trying to get new stuff, right? You're trying mm -hmm. to build a show. Not useful to you. Actually, really long term to just do old. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But it is a temptation Even that you safe. fall into. Yeah. yeah. I like as well that throughout this so far, we're just drive-by shooting like the market towns of the country. Oh, sure, Swindon, yeah. Horsham. Oh, yeah. Stratford in a way as well. And I am going to Horsham going. on tour. So, you know, maybe plug, we'll get maybe plug the tour. We'll get to a bit. We'll get to a routine. They'll hate it and I'll tell them off. <laughs> um, to still talk about the fringe a little bit more. I understand as well, particularly on the early side of things, the financial aspect of it as well is like massive for a sort of starting out performer. Mm. Talking about uh, even if it's just accommodation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's gone there. insane lately as well. Mm. That's gone mad. I was looking at because I was only there for a week. I actually found it harder to find somewhere for a week than because you obviously normally stay for a month. Yep. And uh, it was going to be, I, I worked out, the thing I was trying to find was like, it was like a grotty student flat is what I found to stay in. And it was the same price for the week to stay in the Hotel Duvam. And I was like, well, that is insane, isn't it? I didn't stay in the Hotel Duvam, all the student thing, I found something else for cheaper. But how mad is that, that yeah. we're at that stage? You can stay in the, one of the poshest hotels in the country instead. Um, but yeah, basically, I, it's like, I think it's to do with the way... They used to do these contracts in Edinburgh. Right. They used to do 11-month contracts for students so that landlords could rent out the student flats during the fringe mm. and they would boot the students out. Um, and then that ended. I think Edinburgh Council or someone put an end to that because it's, you know, it's slightly immoral. <laughs> the students were then just like, and here's a month where you have nothing and you're homeless and then you can come back. Yep. So they ended that, which is obviously a good thing. But the knock-on effect of that is that there's nowhere to stay. So there's, you know, supply and demand. Yep. Now there's even fewer places. They've got the 12-month contracts if the student aren't leaving and they're not subletting it or whatever, mm -hmm. which they're probably not allowed to do anyway. Yep. Then there's fewer and fewer places to stay. So what all that's happening is people are just staying further out, basically, but for an obscene amount of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you're early, you obviously have a ceiling on how much money you can make from selling tickets because you've only got 40 seats in your venue or whatever. Yep. So yeah, first few years, you do lose, you, yeah, you lose money. And it's at a time when you don't make any money the rest of the year as well, when you're starting out in comedy. Yeah. So, you know, it's not ideal. None of it's ideal. How do you keep going? There are certain ways around it that came in. So when I was new, there was something called the five pound fringe. So mostly a fringe ticket would be about 10 to 15 pounds in one of the big four venues, they call it, um, which supposedly is where you want to be. Certainly when I started, it's like where you wanted to be. Then there was a thing called the five pound fringe where the deal was much better for you. Every ticket was five pounds. You're more likely to sell out and you can do a bigger room, therefore. Mm. And the free fringe exists. And the way the free fringe works is that you know, people just come in until it's full and it is free, but then you do sort of donations bucket at the end. Here's mine when they were doing that, were always making way more money than anyone in one of these big venues charging 12 quid a ticket just because you keep 100% of that. 
Yeah. So they'd, and they'd always have so much cash on them and coins and they're carrying a big bucket to pour into that machine. Mm -hmm. That was wild that that was happening. Some people this year who had buckets received notes on them with uh, that were Banksy's. They received, I think it was like Turkish currency that's out of date and it would like say like, thanks so much and then Banksy's signature. And then a couple of them got like invited to some Banksy event. Bloody hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you do the free fringe. No bucket. There's no bucket. Yeah, he could have been in my show and I won't even know it. Fucking hell, no Banksy bucket. There's no Banksy bucket. He's just... So that's it. He, he walks among us. In future, I'm going to do a ticketed show and mm. I'm going to say there's a bucket at the end. You don't have to donate. It's just for Banksy. <laughs> this is just if Banksy's in. If you're here. Just let me know. Like stick, a cat burglar. Stick your business card in there. Stick the lira in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it did, if you did receive such a note, mm. are you selling it? Are you keeping it? I'll keep it. I would yeah. keep it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, come on, I'm not selling it. I think no one would believe me anyway, but. Yeah, I'd, yeah, how I'd, do I'd you even check, it. right? How do you know? What would you pay for a Banksy note that has someone else's name on it to do with their Edinburgh show? Is it worth anything to anyone but you? But I mean, people literally, they cut his graffiti out of the wall, right? Yeah, and sure. For hundreds, but millions that's a, of that's pounds. That's a lovely picture. He's drawn a lovely picture. Oh uh, yeah, good point. This is just a, an out of date <laughs> Turkish <laughs> banknote with your own name on it. Yeah, okay. Less valuable, perhaps. Yeah. No, yeah, you would keep it, wouldn't you? You'd just keep it. You got any other nice souvenirs like that from your shows? Things that you keep? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, no, I don't. I've, I, uh, I'm trying to think. I've got the, um, the card from the last Mock the Week episode that is, I did the last stand-up round mm -hmm. on Mock the Week. It was me and Dara did the stand-up on the final ever Mock the Week. And the card in which that is introduced is the sort of like cue card mm. that says our topics on it. I have that in a frame. Nice. Yeah. How do you feel it's about it? incorrect though. It's, it really annoys me. Go on. My subject was parties. It says that my subject was leisure. It was parties. That would that, bother you. Yeah. Infuriating. At least it's not on your wall to remind you of that. Yeah, yeah. It's constantly day. framed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the light shining on it. Always looking at it. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Mock the Week then. I remember growing up watching that show mm. on repeat, the, re the repeats of it, everything. And it felt... It felt basically like an incubator for sort of upcoming comedic talent in this country. Yeah. We no longer have it. How do you feel about that? I think it's sad. I think it feels in general at the moment like it's a bit of a, uh, a bit of an end of a panel show era. I think this is cyclical, though. I think most things are. You know, I think there was a time where sketch kind of dominated for a while. That went away. That will come back inevitably. That's sort of 15, 20 years of panel shows being pretty dominant in British comedy. It's not over. But, you know, a bunch of them, specifically the topical ones, are starting to fall by the wayside. Obviously, I haven't got news for you still going strong, but then you've got a bunch of them sort of gradually disappeared. TV becoming less popular, certainly like event TV becoming less popular. So, you know, the, uh, the need to tune in at a specific time to watch something topical, obviously increasingly irrelevant. Yeah. So I guess it's kind of all inevitable, but obviously it's a massive shame because I was on that show. And um, it's good to be on that show. Yeah. So, so, you know, it sold a lot of tickets. Now I'm doing the Joe podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, did, it, did it feel like that? Like it was an incubated? I think I've got it here that Dara described it as, regretfully, we're closing the doors on Dara and Hughes Academy for baby comedians. Yeah, that's how I think they felt it became. Because obviously, um, everyone their age had left. Yeah. And then naturally like a lots of newer comics are coming on it and or naturally they're going to be younger because mm. not that many people start comedy at sort of 52 so, 17 you were 17 when you started i was right? 17 exactly i wasn't 17 when i was on that show no um but yeah that'd so be it incredible like, wouldn't it it was i mean i think jack whitehall basically was he was yeah. like 18 when he was first on that show that was mad yeah also howard was like 22 or something like that i was i think i was 26 maybe when i first did it mm. but um yeah i think they felt like especially because they would watch these younger generations come on it and then get so big they would leave. The people they would consider sort of like young upstarts, mm. like, you know, James A. Caster or Rob Beckett and Nish Kumar and stuff like that would like, they'd be on it for a while and then outgrow it and move on. Mm -hmm. That they saw this sort of production line of what they, he calls baby comedians yep. um, come through it while they stayed strong. So I can see why he would, absolutely why he would describe it as that, yeah. Do you think... Um talk about the sort of broader sort of media landscape that you, you mentioned there that per perhaps there was a time maybe in the not too distant past where 
getting on TV and maybe it might be a show like Mock the Week, it might be Live at the Apollo or whatever. That was what comedians were aiming at. That's you want you wanted to get there, that was it. And that perhaps now the importance of television has decreased and it might be more, I don't know, people wanting to become like a Sean Burke, Rosie Holt type sort of massive digital mm. following type comedian as opposed to a regular slot on a panel show. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I'd say it's like desire. I'd say most of the people I I I wouldn't like to speak for them. Yeah, I think course. people still go I would love to do these shows. Yeah. They're the ones that exist. You know, people still do want to do live at the Apollo. I think what people realize is that everything changed so that there's obviously way more comedians. It's like completely oversaturated in terms of what you can get on if you're like aiming to get on telly. There's so many more comedians and fewer slots. Mm. So you might as well take it into your own hands at this stage. You know, if you want to make something, it's such a long process. If you pitch even like a TV like format or like a sitcom or anything like that, it's such a long process before it gets made and becomes a thing that is on TV that people can watch. And that could still fail. That could still yeah. be released at the wrong time and no one watches it. And it's six, seven years of work. So you might as well, if you have an idea that you can make yourself, make it yourself and start putting it out there and grow the audience yourself. I think it's at more out of sort of necessity and just thinking like, I can't be asked. It's in someone else's hands. I can't be bothered to just yeah. wait for someone else to make a decision when I could just do a version of this myself. I don't know. Maybe people do, but I don't think people are going, I never want to do any of those TV things. That's the old thing. I want to have this many followers. I think people have both of those goals in their heads instead. And for you, when you started getting on TV, mm. how did that make you feel? Like you made it? Nah, because nothing's ever, you know, it's human nature. Nothing, you go, great, and now I've done that, and now what's over there? Yep. And now what else can it lead to? And there's nothing, you're never satisfied, are you? Mm -hmm. Certainly at the age I was as well, because, you know, it's all just forwards yeah, yeah, when yeah. you're in your 20s. So it's all just, what else, what else, what else? So no, I mean, there would have been a moment. I think the day they said, do you want to... I was really surprised the day they said, do you want to do Mock the Week the first time? Because they'd been to watch me. And then like we'd... <laughs> yeah, because they'd, they'd been to watch me. Um, <laughs> and I remember them being like, I think, you know, they well, maybe we asked them for feedback or something. Or like, oh, did you enjoy the show? Mm. And then they were like, yeah, yeah, he's got potential. And it was just sort of that. Like, yeah, he seems to have potential or something like that. And then like a week later, it was like, which date do you want to do? And I was like, what? Aim higher. I've only got potential. Get someone yeah. who's good, you fucking idiots. <laughs> um, but I'll take it. And then, uh, yeah, I think the day I got asked, I was pretty excited. But then you're just immediately full of dread and nerves. Mm. Oh, my God, what if I fuck this up? Especially when it's something that you have actually grown up watching, like you say. So, like, something that actually meant something to me. It's not, like, a brand new format. When I mean, you consider, like, you know, the Dara doing it and hosting it in Hue. Like, it was a new idea for them. Like, they created it and built mm. it. So it's a different feeling, I guess. It's more pressure... But when you're offered something where you're like, it has a legacy and you well, you can't ruin the legacy, but you can be like a blotch yeah. on the history book of this show. You can be a blip in this thing. You go, I, I want to do this right. You don't want to end up like um, is it Preston in The Ordinary Boys and how he's right, like right. But then, in but, but the you law could, of Nevermind the Buzzcocks. You could argue though, that is maybe the most talked about Nevermind the Buzzcocks thing ever so oh, it's iconic wasn't you could it? say that actually is what never mind the boscocks is yeah and it, if he hadn't done that we wouldn't be talking about it in the same way i guess you could I, argue that i think simon amstel probably feels differently about it than yeah. perhaps preston does sure <laughs> i don't know and as, you, as, yeah. as you as the as you as the the panelist you don't want to have that kind of moment maybe well if dara had started reading out my wife's autobiography then i might have stormed off more of the week but <laughs> yeah. um but she, she i don't have one and she doesn't have one <laughs> um so, uh, interesting thing in that that I'd like to pull out, talking um, as a younger version of yourself, thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, mm. and perhaps not fully sort of, instead of thinking about the next, thinking about actually just where you are in, yeah. in that moment. And don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe not fully appreciating it or necessarily accepting that like actually just being where I am now is an achievement in and of itself. Yeah. Has that, is that something that's changed perhaps as you've gotten a little bit older? Yeah, I guess you more. get more conscious of it. You take stock a little bit more. I, I, my feeling is that the pandemic kind of made us all do that a little bit more anyway. Yeah. And not, I don't just mean, you know, other comedians. I mean, sort of everyone in that walk of life sort of went, where am I? It was like a little breather, wasn't it, at first? Obviously, it was horrible. But it was like you had so much time to actually consider those things because you couldn't move forward. So, yeah, I think you get better at doing that. I think you should take stock. I was always quite good at it at the end of an Edinburgh. I grew up writing lots of teenage poetry and all this sort of bollocks. So I was always someone who was really like thoughtful in a very pretentious way mm. and very thinking about myself and being like emotionally 
in touch with myself. So it was like, I would always, you know, on a walk home through the meadows late at night towards the end of an Edinburgh, be like, you did it, man. Okay. You got through it. You wrote something, you created something from nothing. You did it. Be proud of yourself. But you can't let that last mm. or you're the, you know, everyone hates you. You're the, you become the worst person in the world if you're just like going around saying that out loud. Mm. So you just have to take stock briefly and then just basically shut the fuck up about it, right? Yeah. Um, but it is useful, yeah, to be a bit more like, um, oh yeah, I got to do that thing that, you know, if you asked me when I started, would you want to do this? I think the reason you don't do it with stuff like panel shows and like high intensity pressure, things like that is because it's so scary. Yeah. That you're not thinking, wow, yeah, I'm doing this. You're thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to do this. Yep. Because it means so much. So I guess that is you kind of acknowledging this is a big deal because mm. otherwise you wouldn't be scared. It was one of the uh, most common sort of occurring piece of advice I got before my wedding day. People were saying, try to step back and just absorb what's happening around you Yeah, because it will fly by and by the end of it, it's only going to happen once, hopefully. So, yeah. you know, just try and drink it in. And I guess in a way... It's similar with any sort of, I don't know, standout moment, not just in your career, anyone's career, which usually probably will be a pretty, I don't know, high pressure moment, whether it's giving some kind of presentation sure. or whatever. And actually, it's pretty, it's pretty a bit of a skill, isn't it, to be able to stop and even in that high pressure intensity moment, stop and actually sort of absorb it, try to remember it so that, yeah, down the line, when you look back, you go, it wasn't fucking incredible that I did mop the week at, you know, 26. Yeah, and you don't want to also, you don't want to do it in the exact moment because you've got a job to do. Yeah. So imagine, you know, have you, <laughs> you ever been watching Reese. Mock the Week and someone's just looking around like, <sighs> I've arrived. Yeah. It's like, no, you need to say a joke. You need to be saying a joke, constantly trying to say a joke. And also, it's not the easiest format to get a word in. Yeah. So don't be looking around the room going, I've done it. Or everyone's just going to have moved on. Was it competitive? Not really. I mean, the reputation of it being this bear pit or whatever, where everyone's stepping on each other. By the time I was doing it, it was a lot more friendly. It was like... um. It was all just my mates when I first got on it. You know, it was like, I, it, was like it felt like the sixth formers. It felt like I was going on, it was the sixth formers, and I was in sort of year nine. And Dara when was I the first head teacher. Did it. Yeah, academy. yeah, well, exactly, yeah. Um, so it didn't, and then obviously they all left and went to uni, Sky, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and did um, Rob and Romish Versus, you know, mm. that sort of thing. And then, and the MASH report, whereas I stayed uh, and outstayed my welcome. <laughs> <laughs> instead and then i and then i became a sixth former you know no beyond the sixth former turning up to the sixth form parties on my moped it was pathetic it was embarrassing <laughs> that's how it felt in edinburgh this year actually because in edinburgh you know really? I, I felt like i was like yeah i almost felt like because i was turning up for a week i'm sort of like all the younger generation and sort of like you i you look at comedy generations in sort of when you start comedy rather than how old you are yeah but it did feel a bit like, you know, it's exciting, Edinburgh, when you're doing your debut and you're launching and you're new or even like your second hour or your third hour. When you're turning up to do your seventh, that's just a tour show you've been doing anyway to just swan in for a week. You just go like, oh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm a loser and I'm past this. And actually, I'm a bit old for this leather jacket. And this is a midlife crisis. I think, <laughs> generally speaking, I think we're always probably slightly too old for the leather jacket. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Good rule of life, that. Um, yeah. But at what age? Because I think you can also be way too young for a leather jacket. Mate, so at what age does the leather jacket really come into play? I wore a leather jacket at like 15. Well, that's way too young. Obviously. Who do you think you are? Mental. Paris Bueller. Get a grip. With biker mice from that. Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you between the ages of 18 and maybe 27. Right. Okay. That's when you could have a leather, you can wear a leather jacket. I think you still so. will be a certain type of person though as well. For sure. Yeah. I think bikers get a pass. Bikers get, yeah. Okay. So that's any age. Yeah. Any age. Yeah, I You're almost allowed. think a biker, yeah, it's almost like you want him to be 60 mm. and grey with a beard and tats. That's that's that type of I guess jacket. you still could be having a midlife crisis. You know, if you're like 40, you've bought some kind of like super high-powered Kawasaki thing. You've got a yeah. super tight leather jacket, but you are still just Colin from accounts. Yeah, 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 exactly. Not as cool as like 60-year-old Harley man. No, if you're, you're not going to mess with a Hell's Angel. No. I mean, you could try. You could try and walk up to him and say, mate, you're too old to be wearing a leather jacket. That would be good, um, actually quite a good pitch for a Sky travel log. I will fuck with the Hell's Angel <laughs> and see what happens. Hunter S. Thompson gave it a go, <laughs> didn't he? Didn't, didn't work out too well for him. Um, there was a lot of uh, self-deprecating humor in what you just said about the fringe. There was also, I, I detect perhaps a, sm a faint hint of, it felt a little bit, I don't know, self-loathing a little bit. Do we go, right, okay. Do you want to explore? Uh, do you want to, was that, was it all, was it all comedy? I mean, um, did you genuinely feel like that afterwards that you were perhaps yeah, but it a wasn't, little bit old um, for it or? No, not, I don't mean like age old. Yeah. I don't even mean 
career. I mean, like you get to a point where it makes sense for you to come back for a week and do that right. instead of be there for the whole month. Okay. But I mean, it still wouldn't be weird if I was there for the whole month. I just meant the vibe. When I, basically, when I got there, because loads of my mates who are my sort of school year of comedy were there, and I got there obviously late, and I was talking to them going, oh, how is it? And they were going like, yeah, it's interesting. Like, no one's really like going out late. You know, Edinburgh's typical for being out till 6 a.m., getting pissed, then just like waking up and doing the show. Mm. It was like, it's not really competitive like it used to be. Um, no one's like going out late. And during this conversation, we realized, no, they are. We're old. I think all the all the young people are going out till late. Mm. We're not invited. <laughs> or like, you know, they're not in the WhatsApp groups we're in. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, no, I think it's the same as it always was. And that probably is competitive. Or maybe they're a nicer generation, but that probably is a little bit, you know, like, yeah, yeah. people are trying to get the reviewers in, you know, and there's only so many of them to go around. There's mm -hmm. an award at the end of it for the newcomers. So they're trying to, everyone's sort of, without saying it, because no one wants to say it, everyone's secretly going, oh, maybe I could get a look in there. Yeah. Hope I do. And then pretending, well, I don't even care about that at the end of it. As someone who's probably one of the only people who's professionally qualified to talk about this, what did you think of the best joke from the festival? Well, look, I think that I think my issue really is with that award more than anything else. Go on. Specifically the joke. Yeah. But the award, I mean, like it's it's an it's always a pun. Mm. It's almost always a pun that is a little bit lame. But that's because it has to be published in every news art, like platform yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. So it has to be read by every generation and it has to... It's got to sit next to the number one place to live in Britain in the Telegraph. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a very Harpenden style joke, actually. Um, <laughs> it's the Harpenden of jokes. It's, uh, I think, yeah, it's, I think it's a bit, of, I genuinely think that award is a massive poison chalice because the, scr the scrutiny you're under, also to say anything subjective like comedy is the best joke of the fringe all it does is fuel to the fire of, oh, well, the fringe is shit. Mm. And are these typical fucking lefty liberals thinking this is funny, do they? Um, even though it's not a political joke at all, ever, it's always a pun. Mm. And it's just an excuse for people to go, oh, yeah, I could write, but I could do one better than that. And all, every single time, you're just like, you are welcome to, and you can go and win this award, and you probably will. Mm. Because it's, <laughs> but always the list is insane. It's always an insane top 10 list. It's always kind of Christmas crackery a little bit. It's always a, just wordplay because it sort of has to be, but it almost feels like the whole point of it now is just to trend on X and uh, <laughs> and infuriate sort of everyone who wasn't there. Yeah. But like any joke, it's like, no, it's just sort of in the context of a show and it's probably like throwaway or it's, you know, it's said as like off the back of something completely yeah, yeah, yeah. different and then it's like changing the energy and that's what makes it fun. Delivery sort of obviously is so important, right? You don't just sit there and read jokes or yeah. I don't know, someone gets cancelled for making some kind of offensive or inappropriate joke and i think if you dissected anything and you said sit in that chair and tell say the joke again right yeah, now, yeah, tell yeah. me why it's funny so like, well, obviously it's not fucking funny anymore because yeah yeah, yeah. i'm exactly. not having to dissect it it's not you lose the timing etc exactly yeah um you mentioned in that answer nothing political and i'm interested to talk a bit more about what you see as the role sort of the relationship between comedy and politics i mean we've been talking about mot the week etc but yeah how fundamental politics is to your comedy and just more broadly, I guess, to the, to the, to the art form. Uh, I think it's hard to say because politics is so broad that, you know, it's like what falls under the umbrella of politics right. effectively in terms of day to day MPs, actual political decisions happening in the moment and stuff like that. Really topical stuff. I don't touch it. I, I just not out of, um, you know, Oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to upset anyone. I don't find it interesting enough. Mm. I don't know. I think it's hard to say something new. And I think the far, the best comedy says something a bit new or a perspective that you go, oh yeah, okay. My favorite comedy to watch often is when someone met, someone says something I disagree with and then they give me so much logic that I maybe can come around to agree with it right. effectively. And I just think, and you can do that with politics, but I think you're just in going into a bit of a murky ground. I think there's ways of doing it. A few years ago, I did a Radio 4 series, which was just two episodes. And it was the same subject and it was all like, you know, hot button topics. And one week I was left wing about them and one week I was right wing about them. And basically the point of that was it came off the back of saying a joke on Mock the Week. I can't even remember what it was. And at the exact moment well, that happened, getting two tweets, one which said typical BBC left wing bullshit and one which said unfunny Tory boy with a thin nose. And uh, <laughs> look, I think the nose thing was harsh, though accurate, but a Tory boy and unfunny. Come yeah, on, yeah, this was rough. good stuff. That's rough. Um, and so I was like, right, so it's all just your own confirmation bias. 
Yeah. It's all just what you're putting onto it. In the same way people think that the match of the day running order is biased against their team every single time, mm -hmm. but only their team and yeah. refs only against their team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I thought, I'll just do this as an experiment and see if I can do right-wing comedy and left-wing comedy, neither of which I felt I was doing before. Probably was a bit, you know, on the left side of things, but it wasn't political, but it would be because, you know, I was in my 20s and I was that. So it's like, ah, oh, you're just going to do that. Now, you know, I try and be a bit more subject matter wise, a bit more universal anyway. But um, I did that and I think it made the point pretty accurately. And it was, you know, it was funny and it was really fun to write. It was a really fun both thought experiment and then just like exercise in going, mm. right, you've written loads of, sub loads of jokes about the environment in a left wing way. Now you've got to write some stuff that slags off Greta mm. and find a way to do it that isn't crap that you still think is good comedy. Because it also it can't just be a parody of right-wing comedy. All that is left-wing comedy. Mm. So it needs to be genuinely from that angle and all that sort of stuff. And so it was quite hard, but it was, um, you know, and a couple of the right-wing jokes were incredibly fun to write. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, I'd like to hear more about that because it's sort of a refresh, you know, um, I can't remember what it's called. Is it like Comedy Unleashed or something like that? There's this, yeah. you know, like... Uh, Free speech, right wing comedy, and the refrain that that festival or that I see people on Twitter giving is like, right wing and comedy, oh, not possible. You yeah, know? and I'd be interested to your experience actually. Uh, yeah, trying to write it and trying to deliver it because presumably it is it is actually possible. It's not. Yeah, it's not that hard. Yeah, none of it's but none of it's that hard. Mm. It's not that hard because it's just like yeah. I think no one. I'm not gonna say you should go out and watch comedy unleashed. You know, do what you want, obviously, yeah. but um. I think I, I th we're so obsessed with it being polarized yep. that we can't even imagine it. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's often something's right wing comedy you wouldn't even know. Yeah. You wouldn't even realize. If something's good, you're not thinking that's left wing, that's right wing. Mm. You're just going, that made me laugh, right? That's what a good comedy would do. Obviously, in this radio show, I was literally saying, I'm right wing in this episode. And I'm, I think I, the joke I said it was like, um, people say you get more right wing as you get older and a week has passed. So now nice. I've changed all my opinions. Also, the idea of that show was that I didn't feel I had any strong opinions. And so I was trying them on yeah, like clothes to see what fit. Effectively was the premise of just like, oh, just say the opinions then and see how it feels. I probably did have some strong opinions. You know, that was just a conceit. But it sort of allowed me to then go into it. And then naturally it's a comedy audience. Um, so it was pretty left wing crowd. Plus the tickets were free. Mm. So it's pretty left, <laughs> pretty left wing <laughs> crowd, but it was Radio Four, so you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mix. But bounce. if it, if they felt them pulling back in that recording, I would have to be a bit like, remember, the person speaking doesn't necessarily think these things, mm. but also just would like to remind you of your own bias that you weren't pulling back in the previous episode, yeah, or whatever stuff like that. I just thought it was an interesting experiment, yeah, to, to sort of dig down into it. I wanted to see if it was possible. And I didn't, yeah, I found it surprisingly fine. I just think it's all branding, isn't it? All of it's just branding to go yeah. like, this is it. You can say what you want, right-wing comedy. But in the same way, left-wing comedy does the sort of opposite, left-wing comedy in inverted commas, comedy effectively, where people can take a slant. Yeah. But people just brand everything. We're obsessed with uh, polarization. Nuance doesn't play anymore. And so, of course, everyone's just going to say, this is what it is, by the way. If you listen to a lot of it, you just go, all right, it's just comedy. Mm. And it's just someone's perspective, which is what all stand-up is. It's interesting that um, you're talking about the, the politics is almost um, external. It's, it's the pressure on the act, on the, the actual comedy itself, whether it's from the audience, whether it's from uh, media pressure or social media or whatever, that actually it's the two obviously have a lot to do with each other, but the sort of the relationship or dynamic is almost people imposing their own politics onto an act or mm. their own belief system being whether they if impacting whether they find something funny or whether they engage in the material. It's interesting that it's almost, um, yeah, it's almost like an external thing, right? Driving towards it rather than necessarily something that's emanating out of, of, of material or a stand-up performance. Yeah, well, it's all label. We, we love labels, don't we? Because it tells us it's human nature to go like, what am I? I'm, I'm this. And you don't have to think about anything. You go, I'm this. This is like, you know, we love labels and like deadlines in life, like milestones in life, because they say, oh, if you're, if you're here at this time, then you've done it right. Otherwise, we're just loose and rampant and we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. And it's a, like, you know, a sort of socially lawless land. That 
probably is fine. We would all be fine if it was that. It's just that it's human nature to go like, what are answers for me? Mm. And this is just another example of that, of going like, right-wing comedy. Well, I identify with that, so I'll go to that. Please don't just clip that sentence. Obviously. Um, or left-wing comedy. I identify with that. I'll go see that. <laughs> or neither. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, good, good, God. Well, it's nice to do my last ever podcast, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, but it's the same as anything. You just go like, you know, people brand themselves now in a way outside of comedy as well as I am this and it's a bunch of sort of labels and buzzwords that we've come to know because then you in the hope that the people who also feel that way about themselves go great well I'll go see that then or I'll get on become a fan of this thing because that's me being represented and there's times where that is unbelievably positive for communities that haven't been represented before but there's also times when it's done cynically mm. maybe not even consciously cynically but is just a human nature of course to just go I'm this. Are you this? Do you want to hang out? Effectively, it's that. In the same way you got, I'm a football fan. Do you like football? Do you want to be mates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the same. Oh, yeah. Right wing comedy. Yeah, come to this thing because I'm that. And then you listen to it and half of it, you probably go, well, isn't that just a normal bit about your relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that got to do with politics? What's got that got to do with my conservative leanings? Exactly. Nothing. I shall leave. Yeah. Um, has it, Have you felt that that pressure, uh, whether it's the label putting we're talking about, whether it's political, I don't know, you take your pick, being cancelled, free speech, being left wing enough when you're writing do you let that sort of extra how will this be perceived impact mm. when you're writing or performing not really i think it's like i think it's blown out of proportion a lot of the time i think mm. uh audiences live audiences are pretty savvy they want to see you try especially if they come to work in progress they want to see you try stuff yep. i don't do particularly line testing material anyway but you know if i do it's like you're finding that line I don't know. It's always, there's like always there's one or two examples a year of someone who's like recorded someone trying something when they were finding the line and then newspapers are desperate for clicks. So it's like anything they can do to rile anyone up. Yep. In the same way, Joke of the Free, like all of it is just to go, what can we do to get anyone talking? Our medium is dying. We desperately need people to come to this website. So we're just going to say this. And then obviously it leads to in America, especially, like lots of you've got to put your phone in this pouch before yeah. you can watch it because you can't fit all this sort of stuff. My experience, and maybe it's just the type of material I do, is that like uh, every time I've been doing a work in progress and I've tried something that maybe like, and I was saying something ironically and it was near the line and people have pulled back or done something, and you just sort of learn the lesson in the moment. You make a joke of it in the moment. People find it funny because it's tension breaking, mm. and then you just move on. Now, part of that not being an issue might be my profile level not being as high as some of these American comics I'm talking about. So it wouldn't get clicks anyway. It could, you know, it's, it's that instead. So There's it's, only one way to find out, mate. Exactly, go. yeah. Go as hard as possible. <laughs> and say, oh, no, do film this. Get your phone out right now. I'm about to say some <laughs> tweet stuff. Tweet it. Let's see if I can go Fucking viral, tweet baby. It. Who cares if it's positive? <laughs> yeah, and then you get a whole new audience. Looking forward. Mm. Without wanting to stray into that perhaps slightly um, intense mindset of the younger person who's, I can't be happy where I am now. What's next? What's next? What's next? But nonetheless, what is next? What would you like to do next beyond the tour? What are you thinking about? Um, I've always really wanted to write a book. And I'm not saying that because there's loads of books behind you and I couldn't <laughs> think of anything else. I want to get into microphone production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always wanted to make in leather bound chair, chairs. And host the Joe podcast. <laughs> It's always been my dream to host this <laughs> podcast. So uh, watch your back, actually. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, this is over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've always wanted to write a book. I don't have an idea. That's the problem. Right. But I'd, I want to do that. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Okay. Yeah. Fiction? Non-fiction? Uh, uh, fine, yeah. No idea. Whatever. Depends okay. what they're offering. Nice. Depends um, what they're offering. I've always, I want to write. I'd like to write an essay book. Yeah. Um, funny. A comedy essay book. Yeah. But, you know, the problem with that is you've got to write. You've got to basically write it. And yes. then see if anyone wants it. I find come on, come on, give me the give me, cash. Do me a favor. Yeah, I find the idea. I have a couple of friends who've written them, and the just the prospect of I don't know, eighty thousand words, a hundred thousand yeah. words, words. A fucking dissertation was long enough for me. Like yeah. that was stress inducing, and the idea of going maybe I don't know. You, you do get a book deal, or even you don't get one, and you're like, I'm just going to write one, and hopefully someone will buy it. Yeah, and spending that much time, effort, labor, love into a project like that. I find it insanely daunting. I think the idea in my head is more like I'm, you know, I've had a sort of commission for a book or like a screenplay or something. And then I am in like Rome or mm. I'm at like Lake Garda. Yeah. And I'm like, it, like in love, actually, mm -hmm. I'm sat on the terrace and I'm typing on my little typewriter yep. and everything blows into the lake. 
And it's just that. It's like, I don't care about the actual content. I just want to have that. I want to do that. Yeah, for sure. Black coffee. That's it, yeah. Getting to smoking roll-ups. And you're just doing that. It's like my day is just writing that and then like pottering about into the local town to Perfect. do whatever. The local town of Rome. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, this, look at this little quaint local town. That's another mar <laughs> uh, another market town that's got a drive-by yeah, yeah, yeah. on this podcast, Rome. The Horsham of Italy. <laughs> That's what they call it. That is what it was called, yeah, in Latin, yeah. Um, Rhys James, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having on. me. Really Thank appreciate you. it, man. Thank you.